All right, Kevin Bailey and Camille Salucci, uh, you were the visual effects team, part of the visual effects team on The Walk. And I think the thing that everyone wonders when they go to see this movie is how did you get Joseph Gordon-Levitt to walk a tightrope across the Twin Towers? <laughs> well, it's funny, actually very few people have asked us that question, um, <laughs> which is actually, which is actually a, a good compliment to the work of the team. I mean, uh, so first of all, Joe actually how to walk a wire for real. Um, he trained for eight days before the shoot with Philippe Petit himself, who actually, he has the wire he strung between the Twin Towers uh, still up in his front yard. And he walks it every day, um, even though he's in his mid-60s. Um, and the way Joe tells it is he's just like an insanely optimistic person and uh, made Joe believe that he could walk the wire so that at the end of the day, he could. Um, so in the, a lot of it, he is walking the um, and then for the things that were a little bit too complicated for him to just do on his own, um, we had what we called the Canadian bar, which was a, about a 20 foot long steel beam with a groove in the middle that we kind of raised up into the wire. So the wire could slot into the groove and Joe's foot could wrap around it. And he could feel the wire like he was really walking on it. Um, but there was a little bit of support to the sides and this bar was painted green so we could remove it in post. Um, and then the, the third way was that you know, there's stuff that takes decades to learn how to do on a wire, and there's just no way to do it even with the Canadian bar. So uh, for those, we did digital face replacements. And um, so we took a, a, a crazy detailed scan of Joe's face in, like, a bunch of different poses so we could tell everything from the shape of his face to, like, what the blood flow was doing in his forehead when he scrunched it in a particular way. And then we took Joe's performance and transposed it onto that digital model and then put it onto a stunt performer named Jake Kinder Martin, who did the, uh, the, the crazy complicated stuff. And one of the cool things about his, about getting the face was it with, was with some new technology that these um, guys have put together um, called Pixel Gun. And mm -hmm. they had, they had Joe's completely surrounded in kind of this photo booth. It's almost like doing bullet time with a whole bunch of cameras, only this is like, um, still cameras. So it gave our um, modelers who were modeling Joe's face and making sure that it exactly matched the likeness. It gave them not only the shape of Joe's face, but the texture. And it's also a terrific thing because it allows them to do it in like 10 minutes or less because they can just snap the pictures and they've got the information. Whereas before we would use old laser scan technology that would kind of go around and the actors would have to sit very still and hold a pose for a long time. So. Laser. Cool. Lasers are so yesterday. <laughs> Well, let's talk about uh, creating those towers. Uh, you know, you're working with something that, uh, you know, everybody basically knows what they look like or has a memory of them. Uh, and you've got to recreate them, not only uh, recreate them, but recreate them at the time when they were brand new. Uh, can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, recreating towers was, I think, kind of emotionally the most challenging part of the film because um, we just wanted to do justice to them and really, get, you know, we're careful to treat them with respect. Um, we started with actual blueprints of the towers, which are which are uh, publicly available if you do enough research um, these days. And so uh, we knew exactly how they were built and and um, through like, I mean, we I think we gathered gathered over a thousand reference photos of just the towers themselves. And really, we're able to build it down to every little last minute detail. Um, the problem is that if you build as accurately as a blueprint is, which is like, you know, it's like an architect's wet dream, like to be able to do everything in the computer perfectly. It's like, yeah, that's exactly the way I wanted it. It's like, it looks fake. It looks fake CG. Because when construction workers put stuff together, you know, a little millimeter off here and a millimeter off there and panel gaps. And, you know, maybe this panel came from a different foundry than this one. And all of a sudden, you've got very subtle variety throughout the building. Um, so we actually spent a lot of time kind of uh, introducing imperfection into the towers, but not too much. Too much imperfection makes it small, it hurts the scale. And scale is really important to this film, obviously. So we have to really find a fine, a fine balance between that. And one of the other things about the towers that, you know, as you said, everybody has a memory of the towers. Well, one of the things that it seems that everybody has is so the memory of the towers and what the towers do is that, you know, they're basically reflective of the environment. So some people, in fact, um, one of the executives was walking down the hallway and basically taking a poll to find out, do you think the Twin Towers were white or do you think they were gray? 
what color were the Twin Towers? Because in his mind, it was absolutely they were white. And in other people's mind, it was gray. And we, as we started going through it, we discovered the reason for that. And it really has to do with how reflective the towers are and the fact that they were made of anodized steel. So they basically reflected the entire environment. So they, the team, at first, you know, normally when you're thinking about a visual effect shot, you're thinking about the composition of the shot and how it's going to look in camera and what that exact composition is. Not all the time are you thinking about what's behind the camera and off camera to do the composition of the shot. But this had to be a 360 degree thought process because of the reflections of what the tower looked like. And that's what helped make it look real and, and become a character. In the yeah, movie. they're kind of like chameleons, right? They sort of take on the environment around them. So yeah, it was a really interesting challenge. Mm -hmm. Well, not only that, I mean, you've got to have uh, people on top of the towers. And uh, it's a really uh, seamless blend, uh, just to give you a compliment. Um, yes. So I'm just, I'm curious how much of it was practical on a set and how much of it was uh, a visual effects creation? You know, how, how was that uh, mm -hmm. determined, you know, uh, of what would be what yeah i mean this whole movie through and through whether it's you know the world trade center towers or notre dame or the world trade center lobby or the plaza outside was a real tight collaboration between the art department um, and production design and visual effects um, because we had very little money to work with on the show i think you know the whole budget was 35 million all in and we had to make it look like a hundred million dollar movie right so we had to be smart about everything that we did we couldn't build this stuff an inch more than we needed to so the rooftop of the World Trade Center Tower was a good example of that, where all we built was about a 40-foot by 60-foot corner of one of the towers that was 12 feet high. So it's only what the actors were running around on. So even the middle of it was empty. It was kind of like a big L shape. Mm -hmm. And um, so with the, with the actors always stood on something that was real, but pretty much everything outside of that was a digital extension that we had to, like you said, make, make seamless. Um, so a lot of green screen involved in every single shot. And some of the shots literally just have the wire and Joe and everything else is, um, is digital. And then one of the things for putting the actors on it is um, Kevin shot the actors uh, for their performances, especially for the guys on the distant roof. Like whenever they were the primary thing, Bob was there doing it, but for the, sometimes on the guys on the distant roof, you would shoot that in almost like cards and then be able to put them on the roof. Just on, green. just on green. We didn't have the advantage of putting them on the roof because they were on the opposite tower. And one of the things we had to do was we had to make that corner of the tower work for the North Tower, the South Tower, and the tower when it was finished. So it was also a huge feat for um, construction and the art department and production design to make those changes and get those changes done as quickly as we needed to because we shot this film in, what, 43, 40, 43, 43 days. days. Wow. Uh, for people who aren't familiar, that's not a lot of time <laughs> to shoot a movie of this scale. Uh, <laughs> Easily triple that is, uh, is, the the, is the average. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that a lot of people remember uh, is, are all of those shots where uh, the camera is looking right down at you know, the streets of New York and how high up he is. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, that was all created uh, digitally or did you take some actual uh, footage of the real streets of New York and transpose? How did you, how did you recreate that, the real thing? Yeah, so that was actually a really interesting thing. So all of that's digital. I mean, everything, you know, because 1974, New York was really different from what it looks like today. Um, and, uh, so we had to recreate every single rain gutter and AC unit. You can see little fans spinning, you know, on rooftops and all that stuff had to be recreated digitally. Hot dog vendors. Yeah, hot dog stands, <laughs> like, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, the, there's even like newsstands down on the street that have period accurate stuff because, <laughs> the, yeah, because the guys were just nerding out on it. But, um, but the, the, the way that we actually got it to feel real was, um, I think a big contributor to that was that we took a helicopter above New York, um, modern day New York, obviously for two days with a, um, gyro stabilized nose mount with a uh, 6k red epic dragon on the, on the nose of it. And we did that in order to get a sense of like 
how does the city feel from that height? Like, you know, how fast do cars move? Can you see stoplights changing? Like all that kind of stuff. Um, and we got like ample amounts of that at all different kinds of day to make sure that the city was just alive enough to look interesting, but not so alive as to look small. Again, kind of going back to the scale. Um, the thing that I came away with that I was totally not expecting whatsoever and ended up being invaluable was it actually happened the first time that I hovered uh, into position above the reflecting pools, um, the World Trade Center Memorial. And we had special clearance to hover at 1,400 feet right where Philippe was over these pools. And I just remember going into position there and looking down and being absolutely like overcome with uh, – this, this intense feeling of awe, right? And like, we're in this place that this guy did this crazy thing without any safety gear. Like, and he was right here. Like, just, it was insane. And then utter terror was the other emotion, right? Um, <laughs> it was really, really, really high. <laughs> and, uh, um, and it's a quarter of a mile off the ground. Yeah, it's nuts. And so so I'll never forget that feeling. And, and so coming back to the, the visual effects teams that were doing those shots, um, I was able to evaluate every frame of every shot against that feeling. And if it didn't make me feel that way, then, it, then we knew that something was wrong with the shot and we had to like kind of work it out. Um, so uh, that was an amazing tool to kind of keep everything grounded in the, not just the literal sense of what things look like from that height, but what they feel like from that height. And one mm -hmm. of the things that's interesting in visual effects that sometimes happens is you'll be working with a team and you know they're you've got incredible artists with incredible minds and incredible specificity and they will really work out the math to have it be exactly right and you'll look at it and you'll go well something doesn't doesn't feel right and with kevin having that feeling you know there's moments where you go okay guys make the math wrong and make it feel right mm -hmm. and um so it was really a great a great scale to keep going back to and i remember when you came back you were just when you came off that helicopter that morning and you were just looking at each other like yeah whoa what just this, happened <laughs> this is, we're not this is not kidding <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh and of course this is shot in 3d too so i'm wondering how that affects what you do or if it affects it at all or so i think there's know. an important distinction is that uh this movie was actually not shot in 3d it was shot oh. in, yeah it was shot for 3d okay. Um, no, but that, it's a great compliment. Yeah. So, you know, it's awesome that you said that. We'll, we'll pass it on to the stereographer. He'll be so psyched. Uh, yes, yeah, so we had we knew that, you know, the movie needed to be 3D from we were really early on. But with 43 shoot days, um, there's really not any time to mess around in terms of, you know, shooting a native 3D actually takes a lot of you know, extra time because um, you not only have to, you know, make all your 3D decisions on set, but you also have two, two sets of equipment for every camera to break down, right? So reliability becomes an issue as well. Um, so we decided that we were gonna convert this movie, but because it was such an integral part of the storytelling process to, to Bob, um, who really treats 3D as a tool, um, we had meetings right at the beginning of like, all right, what are our rules? So everyone from the production designer to the cinematographer to us, everyone knew what to do and not to do in 3D. And Bob also had in his mind okay, when I'm going to edit this, I mean, Bob's one of these amazing editors that he has the entire process in his head throughout the entire shoot. Um, he's like, when I'm going to edit this, I'm going to make like really long shots, for example, to help the audience like t soak in the 3D. Um, so, you know, I think that by the time that we got to the actual 3D conversion process of the film, everything had been so thought out and visualized in 3D that Jared Sandrew, our 3D supervisor, um, had a lot to go off of, and their process is amazing too. I mean, you can adjust this stuff in real time now when you're, you know, I actually think 3D conversions are better than shooting native now because um, they, they allow you to kind of emulate what your brain and your eyes, like human eyes do anyway, and filter information kind of selectively. And we present the audience with like a cinematic version of 3D reality um, through the conversion process. So it's actually really a beautiful thing. Yeah, and to give yeah. you um, to give you an idea, when Bob said he wanted to shoot long shots, which most a lot of times in 3d that's one of the rules is that you know longer shots are better than quick cuts because if you do super quick <clears> cuts your mind doesn't actually have enough time to register the 3d fully and so either it doesn't look 3d or sometimes people come away feeling sick because they didn't th their mind is trying to catch up with what's happening so mm -hmm. but bob when he says long shots so an average movie you know dramatic movies maybe come in around 1400 shots 1600 shots really high action or 
or some of these big, you know, um, comic book <laughs> movies or whatever come in at, you know, 22 and sometimes 2,400 shots. So the entire number of shots that we had in our film was 824, right? 825, 826. 826. Okay, so 826. Wow. And our, um, so that's the entire movie. So a lot of times people get on stage and they're like, yeah, visual effects, we did like, you know, 1,700 shots, we did, you know, 1,800 shots. And we're like, well, we did 672 shots. But our entire film was 824 shots. So in that case, what happens is our visual effects have to hold up. You know, for a long time, the rule was you don't want your visual effects to be shot longer than five and ideally three seconds because mm -hmm. otherwise people have too much time to inspect and pull it apart. Well, we had shots that went on for two minutes. Two minutes. Wow. So, um, yeah. So it was a it was a huge feat, and I think some of the three of you guys were like, "We said we wanted long shots, but this is a little more than we we bargained for." <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask you uh, one last question about working with uh, Robert Zemeckis, uh, who's made a lot of films that are known for their bravura special effects. Um, can you talk a bit about what he gives you as a director in order to make this all possible and make it all move smoothly? Uh, well, Bob's vision is incredibly clear um, and he is incredibly decisive. He's not one to change his mind, which is uh, imperative, especially on a movie like this, where we had so little budget to waste. Um, and those things all sound like he's like a dictatorial director. Um, and that actually couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, he will regularly, um, I think it was uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt the other night um, was, was saying that, uh, he, you know, he had a good point. He was like, yeah, it's amazing with Bob. He comes on the set and he, the first thing he says is like, okay, here, we're going to shoot the scene. Here's what I know about the scene. Here's what I don't know about the scene. Let's talk about it. And that's his way of in a very sort of like, you know, humble way saying like, I, I want your guys' feedback and you'll hear him, uh, you know, say that and then take everybody's feedback in and you see the gears start to turn. And then at a certain point, there's like a glint in his eye where he's just like, okay, I put together all this information plus information from meetings two and three months ago because the dude has an insane memory and bam, here's the direction. And then he goes, right. Um, and it all fits within this overall vision of, of the film that he has. So, so I think that really consistently at every part along the process, um, he's incredibly open to feedback. He's really trusting. He never nitpicks anything. He trusts us to nitpick. And as long as things are kind of going against, going kind of in the general line of this vision that he has, the ability to contribute as, as an individual and as a team with Bob is unprecedented but you always know what you're doing, right? You always, you can always follow his direction. Um, so he's a really special filmmaker. And I think a lot of people that work with him get truly spoiled um, by, uh, by working with somebody that is, has his pedigree and his experience, but is also as flexible and open and, and inviting as he is. Yeah, you know, I mean, he has, he's like that, that <clears throat> great combination of completely collaborative and an incredible leader. So you, you have both of those things. But when Kevin talks about the glint in his eye, there's, um, there's sometimes where he gets this little uh, mischievous, capricious glint in his eye. And um, um, if you'd like, I, we can tell you a little bit about a scene that um, people oh, are please do. and they don't know about. Um, this is the one where he duped me, right? This is the one where he totally duped Kevin. <laughs> and so basically, <laughs> The big long story is, you know, we only had so many days to shoot, as, as you can tell. There's a scene that happens when Philippe does his sort of first public walk, where he walks on the tightrope across a pond. And there was a whole bunch of conversations. There were conversations, maybe we're going to try to go to a pond. And, and, and Bob complete. One of the great things about Bob, too, is he's, he's very clear about how long stuff is actually going to take to shoot. And he's very clear about when it's stupid to try mm -hmm. to do it that way. You know, because if you've got Joe over a lake on a wire, what are you doing with the cranes? How are you getting a shot? Blah, blah, blah. It's going to take a bunch of days out of our schedule. We're not going to do it that way. And we were on such budget constrictions that, um, you know, different script, different moments were being rewritten to try to fit into our budget as we were, you know, moving through the process. And um, so when the lake scene came up, he re they rewrote the scene and he rewrote the scene to be kind of a series of stills with some voiceover. 
It was like, this happens, click. Click. This happens, this happens click. click. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, in watching the movie, you may know that there are only a couple of stills in that scene now. But um, yeah, Kevin, you want to talk about it a little bit? Well, yeah. Basically, <laughs> long story short, is he promised me that it was just going to be stills, and I was like, Bob, why are you why are you rolling seventy two frame a second high speed footage on all this stuff? And he's like, Oh, it's just so I can pick the perfect frame for my stills. And I just saw that there's a little glint in his eye. I was like, I think you're planning something else. And sure enough, the first. <laughs> Um, it's all moving footage with like ramping slow mos and whatever. He's like, Kevin, sorry, I, this is uh, it. Just worked out better this way. I was like, this is not an accident. <laughs> but you know, it, it, so it was constructed from some little pools. I mean, literally, the thing that's real in the scene is Joe um, falling into a tiny sort of, as we call it, a doughboy pool, it's a twenty and foot by twenty, 20 foot, foot by twenty foot pool with some reeds, and then all of the fishermen shot in these little pools in a parking lot. Um, mm. in the in their boats one at a time because only one bo boat could fit in at a time and then <laughs> everything else was sort of visual effects wizardry and some incredible work by a company called UPP and Prop. Yeah, yeah, so it was, uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and that's, and it, and it actually worked out even though we shot that whole scene in, in basically a, like a white trash backyard pool. Um, it, <laughs> it, uh, it, it actually did work out and I think that's another one of the geniuses of Bob is he kind of knows when to sort of defer, uh, you know, budgetary macerations. He's like, this is going to work out later. Like, I'm just going to like, you know, I'm just going to move people along. Right. And, and uh, so while I had to laugh to myself when that happened, um, I was right. And it worked out. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. thank you both so much and congratulations on the film. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Really, really glad you enjoyed it. Thanks for it. taking the time with us. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. I did. Thank you very much, and uh, have a great day. Yeah, you, you too. too. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you.